Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and this time we're going to be talking on my introductory astronomy things about how exactly the cosmic redshift happens, meaning there's this Hubble relationship that shows the relationship between how fast a galaxy is receding away from us and the redshift of the light in the spectrum of the galaxy. So how does this actually happen? I'm going to show you the, basically the mathematics behind it, as well as what we mean by measurement, and then I'm going to use some underlying assumptions, which we'll have to leave for later. But I'm going to give you the basics of how we get redshift from the universal expansion. First, we have to remember that atoms and molecules, whatever they are, they vibrate. And when they vibrate up and down, let's say this is a proton. We're pretending there's a proton vibrating as opposed to electron. Usually it's electrons, but hey, I made this little graphic a long time ago. And so I just haven't had a chance to swap my plus for my minus. You can thank Thomas Jefferson for that and Benjamin Franklin. In any event, so you can see that the plus sign has, has lines of force radiating away from it. And if that charge is shaken up and down, then the propagation of the arrows to the right shows how fast it takes for the for the disturbance in that field of one field line to propagate to the right and only one field line and as the field lines change is received by the electron on the right hand side we see it is shaken up and down due to the force the electrostatic force between the plus and minus charges so really what we have is that the actual thing that we call a photon is this wave packet is this disturbance in the electric field between two moving charged particles. So that thing that we see going up and down, that wave, that is a photon, a disturbance in the electromagnetic field. And usually we think of, because electrons are a lot lighter, that the electron itself is usually the thing that instantiates the, elect the, the field because it's small. But, you know, a proton can do it just as well. Something's going to shake it a lot harder, though. So we can easily move an electron Protons are a thousand times or two thousand times heavier, so they're harder to shake. So if you briefly accelerate or shake an electron or a proton, it will create an electromagnetic wave in its field lines, and that we call a photon. So it kind of looks a little like this, where you have the propagating photon that comes along. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end to it. And if we then couch that beginning, middle, and end in kind of a bracket, we see that you can think of it as a ripple packet or a packet of ripples that goes by and that's what we call a photon a photon is a wave packet in the electric field of a charged particle that was briefly accelerated or shaken and it's this group wave group that propagates from one direction to the next that we call a photon now when you shake an electron or a proton it emits photons in all directions but because of the nature of the shaking the photons can be uh, polarized or what have you but as the photons get emitted along these field lines, they propagate out at, of course, the speed of light. And they have a distinct or a semi-distinct wavelength. Because which is the actual wavelength inside there? You can see that there's kind of heights and widths but there's a, to the thing, but the waves are, they're not like easily discernible waves inside of each packet, but they're there. So what we can do is we can look more closely at the photon. And we say that since it is a wave packet, we can describe the wavelength of the photon as the dis distance between successive wave crests inside the ripple packet. So we see the begin the we look at the mid the highest and the next highest one to the left. Now, if the universe expands and stretches the photon, then the distance between these two wave crests stretches. Now, this is actually an extraordinarily tiny effect. It's really, really, really small. But if we add up all of the effects of the photon from its emission from, say, a distant, distant galaxy to today, very far, and let this, this occur over an extraordinarily long period of time without changing the photon itself, then the, or having an impact, get absorbed, get re-emitted, or anything, it just simply travels. And as it travels is affected only by the expansion of the universe, then all of the little tiny stretches that it feels along the way will add up. So let's see what that means. Let's see how it actually does that. And so we're going to have to play math games. And so our math game is first, how do we actually measure distance in cosmic time? And the way we measure distance throughout cosmic time in a homogeneous and isotropic universe that's effectively, that's 
that is uh, that that only has uniform expansion is with this metric and this metric describes the a universe that is uniformly either expanding or contracting has uniform curvature and is isotropic and homogeneous throughout but the our really important thing throughout this metric which describes distance which is the left hand side of this this ds squared which is a little tiny distance in space time and that's equal to a little tiny distance in time dt squared times the speed of light squared and then you have this thing in big brackets which describes the distance that it travels uh, in one direction or left and right and we have the dr which is the distance radial direction that's the radial direction meaning say straight from the electron that's vibrating that we saw earlier well, let's make this simpler because we really don't care about the left-right movement, meaning we're not worried about photons that get diverted left or right. We want something that's coming straight to us. And we don't want the things that come into our field of view from over there, from say from the left and then get diverted for some reason. We want photons that come straight to us and don't get affected by anything. So that's, we're gonna cancel the first term, that, that far right term and get rid of that. So we only care about things that are coming straight to us and not coming from either side to side or coming in from the left or coming in from the right. We want things coming straight to us. Next, let's actually make our lives a lot easier and assume a flat universe and get rid of the curvature term. Now we don't have to do this, but it makes the math a lot easier. So it's actually effectively pretty easy to do. Um, and so we just look, get rid of that bottom term. So now we're, we're simplifying this equation and our final simplification is the concept of a null metric. And we eliminate the left-hand side, which means we set it equal to zero. A null metric means that ga that light travels, uh, it, it doesn't spend, doesn't go any distance. That's what null metric means. It does not go any distance in space and time. It simply exists and is immediately, to its perception, immediately absorbed as soon as it gets emitted. So they don't really travel any distance in space-time. Well, that's kind of a weird way of talking. We know from our perspective, they go from left to right or from here to there. But according to the photons themselves, they don't travel any distance in space-time, which is fascinating. But when we think about this way, um, we actually can have a highly simplified equation that looks a lot like this. So that's what we end up with. And it looks really simple. We got a zero on the left hand side. We got time dt squared and we got dr squared, which is kind of some kind of distance. We could have said x. But we said radial distance to kind of mirror the radial nature of the shaking of the photon. And we are left with that a of t, which is the scale factor. That's the a of a as a function of time, how the universe grows grows with time. So let's rearrange that equation to show, to look at it. It's extremely simple now. We have C being the speed of light, DT is a little in, a little interval of time, and DR is a little interval of distance, and A of T is the, fun, is the scale factor of the universe as a function of time. So what we need to do then is add up all of the little contributions as it goes from here to there in time and dr from here to there in space. And then we take into account a of t, the scale factor at every moment in, the, in this isotropic and homogeneous universe, what the scale factor of the universe is. So what that'll look like is this, and that's what summation, and that's what those kind of curly uh, s's mean, those long stretched out curly s's mean summary. So in integral calculus, we call this an integral, but we're just gonna call it a big sum. And we're gonna sum up all the contributions from the time it was emitted to the time it was observed. And that distance is zero the time at the time it was emitted, it hasn't gone any place. And R is the total distance that it goes. And that might be, you know, uh, 100 million light years. R might end up being 100 million light years. And time of emission might have been, say, when the universe was 100,000 years old. And the time of observation might be when the universe is 13 billion years old. Could be anything. So that's the distance it will be traveling in on the right-hand side. And the left-hand side is how long, according to the cosmic clock, it is traveling. And C is the speed of light was a constant, so it gets pulled outside the integral. But really, that's the whole photon. But the funny thing is, we actually want to see the difference in length that happens to a single photon. Remember, we want to see the stretching of the photon, so we want to see the distance. So really, we care about a racing between the, the top peak and the next peak. So we want to see the difference in length that happens to a photon. So we want to say 
lambda sub naught is the wavelength that is observed at divided by the speed of light and lambda sub e which is the wavelength that was emitted at so we have a tiny 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 change that wavelength which is the distance between two crests so we care about just the distance between two crests it doesn't change the distance over which both crests travel but we want to see how that distance between two crests change with time. And so we have two equations and we're going to take the difference between them. So the bottom equation is the first one that shows, well, here's the, how long it's going to travel. And then we that didn't really specify which wave grasp. That's the bottom equation. But the top equation of the two specifies the next wave crest in the wave packet. So we have two equations and we're going to subtract the bottom one from the top one and rearrange it. So after we play around with the algebra and we uh, do some fun with the integral calculus and how integrals work, how summations over lots of things work, we end up with the bottom. And the bottom shows that we only care about two summations. The first is when the time of the first peak was observed, time ob, because it's going the same distance, remember? It's ending the same distance, so we, we are only left with a time change. So the previous slide showed us that, oh, it's both going the same distance, so when we subtract them, we get rid of the right-hand side, so we have to rearrange it because we have two things, one subtracted from the other, and we rearrange things, so with a little bit of algebra, we're left with this. So we only end up with the time of observation, that's what T-OB stand for, and time of emission, which is T-EMIT, that's what we have there. And we only care about the distance between these two extraordinarily short time intervals, T-OBS and T-OBS plus one wavelength, or and then T-emission to the time between T-emission and the T-emission plus one wavelength. So those are two really, really far distances. Now, here's the funny thing. Across two of them, it's not going to, across that very short time interval that we're summing over from T emit to T emit plus one wavelength and T obs to T obs plus one wavelength, the universe's scale factor will not change that much. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat it as a constant, the A sub T is a, a constant as we go from one to the other. So all we really care about is the top equation. As the universe expands, what I've done is I've extracted from those two equations, the equation previously, the scale factor at the time of observation and the scale factor at the time of emission. Because in the time, in the tiny, tiny, tiny time interval between the, the, uh, two, uh, the passing of two wave crests, the universe isn't going to change size very much. So it's effectively constant, so we can extract it from the from the integral. And we're left with the bottom integral after we say, wait a second, that's just one wavelength. So the equi the wave the integrals that are to the right of the scale factor, the inverse scale factor, are just simply the wavelength at either observation on the left and emission on the right. So we have an extraordinarily simple equation that then can be rearranged because this is what's interesting. If we only have a change in wavelength, uh, then we have the redshift. But that's the redshift. We're just rearranging things. So we take the bo that bottom equation and simply rearrange it, and we get the definition of the redshift. And that's what we defined previously. So 1 plus z, which is the redshift, is simply the ratio of the, the, lamp the wavelength of observed to the wavelength you admit that it was emitted at. That's the definition of redshift. We don't have to. That's nothing new. That's completely the definition. But because of the equations that we messed with and the stretching of the universe, we now know that the wavelength observed it divided by the wavelength that it was emitted at is equal to the inverse ratio of the scale factors of the universe at those two times. So this is where we get it from. The stretching happens. The wavelength, the stretching of the wavelengths happen because the universe is actually expanding and all the little tiny bits of expansion add up just these tiny, 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 tiny bits, but they only really matter at the beginning of the end because that's the major changes that we actually see because we're, we're looking at the effect on two successive wave crests. And as, they, as this photon travels, it gets very gently and very the tiniest amount of stretching happens at each one. But by the end, it's, it has changed. So when we finally observe it, we see the, the effect of the stretching. 
Well, what's nice about this is that we end up with a bunch of linked equations that relate back to the Hubble expansion, which is V of t, which is the speed like in kilometers per second, is equal to the Hubble parameter or the Hubble constant h naught, which is roughly about 69 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And d as a function of time would be say, say 10 megaparsecs or something. We know the redshift, which is a speed, is equal to the speed of wave, the speed of light c times the redshift z, which we measure by looking at the observed and emitted wavelengths of light. So if we know that it must be hydrogen, and we know the emitted wavelength of hydrogen, and we see the hydrogen observed, if we see what it observed at, maybe it's not 660, uh, 656.3 nanometers, but now it's like 700 nanometers, it's been lengthened, and that is the redshift. And then we can see from the redshift z what the actual size scale of the universe is then, as opposed to what it is now. Luckily, for our advantage in everything we ever do in cosmology is we, we kind of define A of now, the scale factor of now, as 1 to make things a lot easier. And then or ago will be some number less than 1. That makes things a lot easier. And that also uh, helps us with the definition of the redshift z. So if we have it equal to, we want a redshift of, of 0 at today, we want a redshift of equal to 0. Uh, then if a of now equals one, uh, then and we're looking at things that are really close by, then the redshift of, is of course zero. So the lesson that we want to really show is that we actually have a way of directly measuring the redshift of a galaxy, which is easy to, done, to do because we know what it's emitted at. So we then equate that to a, a redshift velocity, v, and that gives us the Hubble value, and that gives us the distance. This also demonstrates how we know, according to how we measure space-time in general relativity, using the Friedman, Roberts, and Walker metric, which shows how we measure space-time in, uh, in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, how redshift itself naturally falls out because of the way photons work. They get stretched. Isn't that really kind of cool? I think so. We'll see you next time. <laughs>